Well, another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. Today we're talking about motorcycles. And this is uh, one of my favorites. This is a Norton 650 SS. Now, when I was a kid in high school, British Twins, 650 cc's. Oh my God, that was just unbelievable. A 650, that was like the biggest bike you could buy, or one of the biggest bikes you could buy. Certainly one of the fastest and most powerful. And we always think of the Triumph Bonneville or the BSA Rocket. But Norton built a 650, this one here which is actually a good 10 miles an hour faster than some of the other British twins. Uh, I think Cycle World back in 64 road tested this and got 119 out of it, whereas the Triumph Bonneville did 109. I know those numbers seem pretty anemic these days compared to all the superbikes, but it was fast back in the day. These were light, great handling motorcycles and a lot of fun. The 650 SS didn't really make it here in America, they didn't bring many in because Norton had come out with a bike called the Atlas, which was a 750. I don't think it was as fast or as powerful as this. As I remember, I think it had a single carburetor, but it had more torque and it was more of a big touring bike. Don't forget the Harley Sportster was 900 cc's. Oh my God, that was huge. Uh, now that's the smallest bike in Harley's fleet, but back then that was considered uh, a big number. But more importantly, more than even the bike is the man who restored this bike. You know, these old twins, they take a lot of fiddling and a lot of care to get them just right, to get the electrics and everything. And uh, this was restored by a man named Walter Warsh. Here's, here's a picture of him. He has passed away. I own another bike that he did, a BSA. And it is probably the most perfectly restored motorcycle, much like this one. It's hard to believe this bike has 47,088 miles on it. There aren't many British twins that go that far, but when they're done right and they're restored properly, this is proof that it can last forever. Walter was, he was a German car mechanic and he restored mostly Mercedes and German automobiles. And then later in life, when he got a little bit older, he started to restore motorcycles. I'll show you some of the pictures in a little bit. Just so meticulous, everything done perfectly. Notice the all these miles and notice the, the not even any bluing on the pipes because the carburation and everything is set up just right. Um, he ceramic coated the inside of the pipes. He did just, just beautiful, beautiful work. I mean, this looks like a bike that just rolled off the assembly line. I don't think they even came off the assembly line this good, but notice there's no oil weeping on it and it runs and handles oh, just, just fantastically. These are really amazing motorcycles. Um, you know, there was no hydraulic brakes, there were no disc brakes, just, uh, well, this had the feather bed frame, that was the famous Norton frame, uh, named so because one of the famous riders said, how was the bike on the racetrack? He said, it rode, it was like a feather bed, it was so comfortable, I don't know if I go quite that far. You get a little bit of vibration, but not much. Well, there's another thing, you know, when I read the period road tests, they said that the, uh, this twin was nice, but the vibration bothered a lot of the riders. But you know, Walter did such a perfect job of balancing this motor. The, the mirror, everything's, I get hardly any vibration at all. So if the factory had done as good a job as Walter did, perhaps this uh, bike would still be in production. Well, actually, in a sense, it was later superseded by the Commando, which was the fastest bike of the 60s. Remember the Dunstall and all that kind of stuff. I, I like this model. This kind of harkens back to my youth. Just look at the detail work on this bike, how nicely it's put together, how nice it's done. And the fun thing is keeping a, uh, a file on this motorcycle. Oh, here's my file on this bike. You got your maintenance manual. This looks like it was printed in 1890, but it's only uh, 61, 62, but eh, everything is nicely laid out. This is actually for the, for the Atlas model. You know, they, they, they uh, weren't very many of these available in the United States. Uh, master parts list. What do we got here? Norton Spares. Norton is an old company you now. They, they go back to, God, the turn of the century. Here are some photographs of Walter restoring the bike. Okay, well, there you go. As you can see, he kept a meticulous record of everything that he did. There's your amyls on there, your carburation. You know, they say change those because they're finicky. No, not Walter, he got them to operate perfectly. 
is Paul Dunstall priceless. Let's see how much stuff is going for. Five gallon petrol tank, all aluminum, $13. Well, I'm not paying that, that's ridiculous. Tank strap, $2. What am I, made of money? And yeah, that's about it really. That's just the file I have on this bike. It's, it's fun to kind of just save all this stuff, pass it on to the next guy that gets the motorcycle. I mean, this was 1990, the bike was what, 30 years old? My God, now it's, you know, 50 something years old. And the next guy that gets it after me, someday somebody will be driving this bike when it's 100 years old. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, let's go over it, show you the controls before we take it for a ride. Uh, the bar end mirror, that was not period. We put that on. It's crazy to drive a motorcycle without a rear view mirror. This is your high and low beam, your horn right here. This is your clutch right here. This is your steering adjustment, dampener, damper. Uh, headlight switch, speedometer, of course. Odometer, tripometer, as I said, 47,000 miles on a British twin. That's pretty amazing. Ammeter, tachometer, kill switch to kill the engine, choke. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, this seemed like a huge bike. Either I've gotten bigger or the bike has gotten smaller. I'm not quite sure what has happened. I think it's probably the first one. Um, uh, oil tank on this side, battery and electrics in here, what electrics there are. It's pretty simple. These were not exactly maintenance-free motorcycles. But back in the day when you had a motorcycle like this, it was probably your most cherished possession. You, you know, you kept it in your garage and every night you went over it with a wrench and tightened things. Not like today where people just sort of park their vehicle and walk away. Most folks were intimately involved with their cars or motorcycles back in the day because you had to be if you wanted them to run properly. So let's, uh, let's take it for a ride and see how it goes. Right now, we're going to find a road that's better suited for this bike. This is not a freeway interstate motorcycle, although it performs flawlessly in that capacity. Let's find a nice, fast two-lane road where we can really enjoy the handling and the shifting. The thing I love about this motorcycle, everything is metal. There's no plastic, no plastic headlight shell, no fake chrome rim. It's real chrome. I love the concentric gauges. You know, they don't, the needle doesn't wave around. Well, this road should do nicely. This is exactly the kind of road this motorcycle is built for. Nice, fast, two-lane road up into the hills. 60 miles an hour, you're turning about 3,100 RPM. Very torquey motor. As you can see, it pulls nicely in fourth gear. You know, 650 cc's is just about right for a British parallel twin. You know, I never liked it when Norton went to 850. I always thought the Triumph Daytona 500 was really a sweet motor. 650 was okay. When they went to 750, eh, it didn't feel right to me. When we stop, I'll show you something kind of cool about the carburetors. A little attention to detail I find fascinating. Back in 1962, this was one of the fastest motorcycles in the world. I really like this classic English riding position. You sit up straight, you know, there's no pressure on your arms because the wind holds you up at anything over 50 miles an hour. You know, what bonds you to a machine is how it performs. If it performs all its functions swiftly and accurately without a lot of, you know, having to force it, that's what makes it really enjoyable. That's what's enjoyed about this motorcycle. You know, you're not ah, you know, trying to get it to shift gears. You just touch the pedal and click, click, you know, just fingers and toes. You can do this whole bike on fingers and toes. Very light clutch, very light touch on the gear lever, and it shifts perfectly. It's a torquey little motor. I can slow down in fourth gear and open the throttle and still pull away fine. That's what I like. You just touch the controls and it shifts. Nothing forced. Nothing jams up on you. That's when you know an engine and a transmission have been put together properly. The frame transmits the road feel to you perfectly. Never quite understood why people had radios and Bluetooth and sort of uh, MP3 players on their motorcycles. This is one time when you can communicate with the road. Kind of be alone and enjoy the solitude. I couldn't imagine taking a phone call now. Hello? Ah! Boom! See? Your iPhone and Google Maps can show you what this looks like, but this machine can actually take you there. 
can actually take you to the place that's on the Google map. I know it's a little out there as a concept, but it's pretty interesting. It's hard to believe we're just like seven or eight miles from my shop, but that's what's great about California. You know, everybody thinks the traffic here is so terrible, and it is, but you go 10 miles off the freeway in any direction, and look, you're in the middle of nowhere. I want to show you something that's kind of cool about this bike, the attention to detail. Now, as we've been riding for about like 40 minutes, pipes aren't blue, nothing's weeping oil. Walter did just such a beautiful job of putting this together. The reason I think it was faster than the Bonnevilles and some of the BSAs, notice they have the two uh, Emil monoblock carburetors. I don't know if you can see this. Your normal float bowl, the one on this side is about this big, but because they wanted to get it close together to the inlet track, they cut the float bowl in half on the, on the first carburetor here, so it's about half the size of the other carburetor. Uh, the float bowl, rather, is about half the size. So it allows, allows you to get the two carburetors closer together, closer to the inlet track, so you get a better flow of fuel, and that's worth a few extra miles per hour. You know, when this motorcycle was manufactured, Britain was at its zenith. It was the second largest producer of automobiles and motorcycles in the world, certainly the largest producer of motorcycles in the world, and second largest producer of automobiles and trucks right behind uh, the United States. Perhaps it was that cockiness of knowing they were the biggest producer of motorcycles that caused them to get a little complacent and uh, and not maybe put the workmanship and the foresight into uh, a lot of the machinery in later years. I always remember uh, one of the heads of the uh, motorcycle firm, I think it was BSA, he told a reporter that motorcycles enjoy decoking their heads on a weekend. They enjoy taking their motorcycle apart and decoking the head. Well, I don't think anybody enjoys that. It's just something you, <laughs> you have to do. And consequently, by the time the Japanese came along with their oil-type motorcycle, electric starters and disc brakes. Uh, the writing was on the wall. But this is all before that. So let's just enjoy this period while we can. And like any British bike, when you just touch it, it goes right into neutral. You know, that's, I hate that thing where you're clicking up and down and you can't find it and you're holding the clutch in. That's, you know, a transmission is put together properly. Let's see how she goes on the freeway. Pulls nicely. You know, a five-speed would be nice. Now, these are the kind of bikes, after you ride them a couple of hundred miles, you put them in the garage, and the next day you go in with your set of Whitworth wrenches, and you give everything a little half-turn. You know, stuff just loosens and backs off. But I really think that kind of thing helps you bond with the motorcycle. Well, take this helmet off. I guess I'd like to dedicate this segment to Walter, who did such a wonderful job of storing this bike, and his uh, lovely wife, Teresa. You know, Walter passed on a number of years ago, but the fact that, her, that she uh, really cherishes her husband's legacy and understands his passion, his genius, and made sure this motorcycle went to somebody who understood it as much as she did. So, uh, Walter, God bless you, my friend, and Teresa, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you all next week.